Hey guys, this is Nick coming to you from the Planet Aqua Magna with my first review of Bionicle G2's 2016 Winter Wave sets. In this part of a series, I'll focus on the smaller sets, then I'll make a video focus on the Toa and their combined modes with the creatures. We'll be breaking form a couple of times this year, but we'll cross the bridge when we come to it. So last year we had the Toa, and if LEGO left it at that, it still would have been great to have them, but thankfully LEGO still understood the importance of releasing smaller companion sets, not just as a way to give kids a cheaper or easier to afford alternative to the larger Toa sets, but as a way to make the world of Bionicle feel more fleshed out, more cultured and meaningful and rich. This is a trend we saw every single year all throughout Bionicle's first generation. Well, mine is 2010, I suppose. And it's nice to see that LEGO hasn't forgotten about that. If it was just the Toa and the bad guys, G2 would feel a little hollow to me. The Protectors were a good start. They had vibrant colors and the most complex builds we've ever seen from a Matoran-like series of figures, at least in terms of piece count and posability. They were pretty great, but where do we go from here? LEGO could have simply done the same thing again, releasing another wave of similar villagers with more or less the same builds as last year, with some new colors and weapons and what have you, and I guess that would have been okay. Still, even that far back, people like me were hoping there would be something more, something like... Animals! Neat! As a person who grew up building creatures like the Nui Rama and Nui Jaga, I can't tell you how satisfying it is to me that we actually have animals to make a Kota feel that much more populated. I also like that most of them don't look like terribly aggressive or evil creatures, more like they're just part of the island's ecosystem like any other animal. We'll come back to this at the end of the review though. Let's just look at the creatures themselves. One thing I'll point out right off the bat is the creatures' heads. On the one hand, yes, there's that part of me that initially thought, what? Lego could only afford one mold for these guys too? It's like the protector mask only somehow worse. However, there are important reasons for why they went with this, and it's mostly for the gimmick. These creatures have to be able to fit over their respective Toa's heads like a helmet, so the bottom and inside of the creatures' heads are very hollow. So yes, the creatures themselves unfortunately do suffer in some ways to make the gimmick work. That said, it is a good gimmick, and I'll expand on this when I get to the Toa review, but for now, I'll just focus on how this piece works out for the creatures. The piece itself is a great shape that does somewhat hide how gappy the underside is, enough that it doesn't even bother me now that I've gotten a feel for the creatures in hand. It's very wide, with sharp cheekbones and a strong beak or snout or whatever it is. There's something dragon-like about it, but it's just non-specific enough that I could see it functioning fine as whatever each creature needs it to be. Well, except maybe Kitar. He's probably the most alien out of all of these. Don't think for a second that I'm saying this as a criticism, though. The shape is really nice, and the tip of the sides droop far down enough that from most angles, you won't even see the gappy bottom. So I'll give LEGO points for making this less of an issue in whatever ways they could. I really like the detailing on the heads. The marks etched along the sides are great for what they do. All of the Toa's new masks have little markings, usually their Nuva symbol and sometimes some extra little runes trailing off to the side or at the top. The patterns of the creatures look enough like the Toa's own markings to fit each one just fine, and are never so specific that they clash with any one Toa. I find it pretty impressive that they were able to cram this much detail into a single piece shared across all these sets. The colors are also good. Yeah, it's a little silly that you have three silver heads and three gold heads, but the translucent colors blended into the frills of each go a long way to make up for that, and I'd say the choices for which creatures get the cooler, more neutral silver heads and which ones get the warmer, more intense gold heads were good choices that make the other colors really pop. I also appreciate that this piece has a few extra connection points. You can add horns or feelers or ears, I don't know, to make each one feel distinct and add an extra splash of color. Hey, it's more variety than the protectors got with their one mask. My favorite detail of all is the eyes. Unfortunately, it's not a trans element or a hole or anything like that, so I understand if people look at it as a compound eye, or some other sensory organ that just looks like an eye but isn't. Looking at it as an eye though, I really like that the bottom eyelid is raised up like it is. It just makes these guys look excited to see you. It's pretty cute and makes them a lot more expressive and endearing than they'd be without such a subtle touch. Again, LEGO has taken something that easily could have wound up being bland and soulless, and then everything they could to inject as much personality into it as possible. Designing a cool mask is one thing. Here, they had to make an actual face, a head, that would work for all of these animals and complement the Toa. That's gotta be so much harder to do, but somehow they did it. Now let's talk about each creature by itself, starting with Akir. Akir is a nice build, with articulated claws and wings. Sure, each wing is on a ball joint as you'd expect, but you can also spread some of the feathers further apart if you want. Akir is small enough that the wings feel powerful and it's easy to give him dynamic poses. The head mold is a perfect fit for him, the beak looking fierce and the eyes looking just playful enough not to make him mean or threatening. Of course, the sheer size of the head compared to the rest of the body adds to that cuteness factor, but not so much that he looks like a joke or too chibi. His colors are also good. I don't like it much when figures try to juggle gold and silver pieces together, but it's done in a smarter way than usual here. 
the gold bits are on the body, head, and tail, forming the core of the color scheme, while the silver bits are only on the extremities, away from the body. The fiery trans colors and black spine hold these parts together well. He has a lot going on and is kind of messy, not gonna lie, but he doesn't look bad by any means. His feet have a lot of range, with two moving talons on the front of each foot and a third one on the back. The rear talons connections are a little overdone, I guess, but it gives you some good options and doesn't really get in the way of anything. One thing that's nice about this figure and most of the others, he has a gear function. Sort of. It's more like a half gear lever thingy jingy. His tail feathers are connected to the lever, so moving the tail up and down flaps his wings. This coupled with the shoulder joints give you a huge range of ways to make a move, depending on how far back the wings are posed normally. It does end up looking kind of gaudy, but not as much as some of the others. One problem this does create, though, is the same problem that some of the Toa had last year but managed to fix this year. While the Toa and the new Force Awakens construction line introduced new torso builds, we're still using the same torso piece that protectors did for the creatures. So with the wings connected to a gear function, you end up having unused shoulder joints. Whoops. Kinda makes me wish they'd make a new piece to take care of this. Only three of the creatures have this problem, but come on, why is this still happening? I do like the piece of unification though. Like last year's texture add-on used as a chest decoration by the protectors, this piece gives the creature some of that old school bionicle feel. It is a good size and shape that wraps around the spine and doesn't clash too bad with the other elements on these creatures since most of them don't even have the standard CCBS plates we're so used to seeing, having much more old school technic focus builds. Uxar's build is very similar to Akira's in some ways, even implementing the same function, but there are some differences. Uxar being insect-themed lacks Akira's shoulder joints. I would consider this a con if it wasn't accurate. Some parts of the wings do have hinges though, so you can make them droop or spread them out however you like. The flapping motion is much more rigid though, as it should be. The mechanism in this case is a thorax. I gotta say, layering this G1 plate over the pointy bit was a smart move. The pieces flow together well, creating a sleek shape that helps differentiate Uxar from Mika and the others. Further differentiating the two are their stances. Iker stands upright on two legs, while Uxar uses the upper ball joints for more legs so he can stand on all fours. Giving the two completely different postures helps set them apart, though it does have an unfortunate side effect on Uxar, whose wings are so huge and so heavy that they may end up drooping sometimes. Eh. Iker doesn't have this problem thanks to his more upright stance. Oh well, it's not a huge flaw, the function still works. It's just that one of those days, those wings are going to start to sag. The color scheme is simpler than Akir's, and pretty nice overall. His body is mostly gray and silver, but those wings have such a presence, man. They really grab your attention and say, Yes, this is the green one. I also like the yellow bits here and there, and those feelers do add a lot to make him more insect-like as I alluded earlier. I like to think the grayish parts of the body are an exoskeleton, and the green bits are just some softer parts. Akita the creature of water is a bit of an oddity. She's the only one who doesn't use any gears or the standard torso. Her entire body, almost completely technic based, is built around one CCBS bone. That's kind of funny to me. She does have a function, but it's more for galley's sake than Akita's. Still, it does add a bit to her posability in a weird way. You can use it to change a forward angle of the fins. In fact, as much of a brick as the main body is, all of her appendages have a great range of posing options that complement her long, streamlined body. Each movable part by itself may not do much, sure, but moving them all in conjunction gives her a distinct flow that feels completely natural. I also like the color scheme. There's so many shades of blue here, but it's not quite as jarring as Katar's range of colors, which I'll get to in a minute. There's also a big focus on trans pieces, probably more so than the other creatures, which I'm always fine with when it comes to water-themed characters. To top it off, there's a few bits of orange sprinkled around the figure, similar to the yellow accents on last year's counterparts, and I love how much life it adds. The first thing it makes me think of is a clownfish. It's just appropriately bright and exotic for something like this. Yeah, I could have done with a bit less grey in the middle, but it's dominated by all the other colors, and the silver head works well enough. Interestingly, Akita is the only creature to include last year's launchers that were such a huge thing then, and I like the choice of color. And even these things can be posed in some ways, and the cherry on top of this sundae is something I wish more sets like this came with. A stand. At least Ikara and Uxar have legs to stand on. For this set, a stand is basically necessary when you're not playing with it, and yet it's so unexpected. I wish so many more sets with similarly sized things meant to fly or float in their fictional worlds came with these. Heck, the stand works great if you want to make Ikara and Uxar look like they're flying and leave them like that. It makes me wonder why they didn't each come with a stand too. It adds so much extra value despite being such a small thing. So yeah, Akita is a great set, probably my favorite of the bunch. We still got a few to cover though. Kitar is an oddity in many ways, and he's gotten a beating from a lot of reviewers and fans. His build is clunky and wobbly, his tail is a stick and barely works like a stinger should, and his colors are all over the place. 
Similar to last year's Skull Scorpio, people have put this down as 2016's worst Pionicle set. And okay, he may very well be, but if this is really the worst set, I'd say this line is doing pretty good. I didn't think much of Kitar at first, but I had a bit more fun than usual building him. Everything was just so weird, I didn't know what was going to come next. As for the final product, there are things I like about him. As awkward as his posture is, I think it serves to make him feel more alien. Like, there could actually be something shaped like this out there. As many shades of brown as there are, they're mostly focused in certain areas, the only really stupid bit being that 110 gear, but I'll take that over another boring grey one. Even the dark tan plate on his top looks appropriate, it feels like something layered over the softer, fleshier looking burnt orange parts, and as much trans neon yellowish green as there is everywhere else, I don't think it gets obnoxious. As many shades of brown as there are, there's enough brown in general to contrast the green bits. The only place where it gets obnoxious is the blades, where they use ordinary lime instead. I don't like this much, but it's so far away from the rest of the body, it doesn't feel like that much of a distraction. And the silver head, tail, and other bits go together well. Most of these figures are juggling three important colors, and this guy does go a little overboard by adding other varying shades of one or more of these colors, but as messy as he looks, I actually think it's kind of fitting. He feels like something made to live in a wasteland where things really get pretty. Now about the posability and functions. The legs work, the neck works, and the claws work, but only the legs really work that well. Moving the head too high gets it in the way of the function, where you move the tail from side to side to make the claws swing up and down. This is why the tail's other movement is so impeded. It's made to act as a lever for the function, it really only looks like a tail. Still, they could have added one more ball joint, just saying. This also messes up the claws a bit since it's very easy for one of them to be pulled down by gravity and pulled the other up. Getting them to stay a certain way isn't that hard, but it is a little tricky. Kitar is one of those figures we seem to have at least one of every wave that suffers for the sake of being built around a gimmick. That said, as much of an apologist as it must make me sound like, I still kind of like him. I like the build, I do like the function when it works, and I do like the colors for the most part, as much as he is going against him. He does have a lot of problems, but they aren't big ones in my book. I do think he's incredibly flawed, but not downright awful. I even like that he's always sort of stuck in this posture. When I finished building him, I thought it made him cute. Which I know is dumb, but I don't know, I like that this thing that should look mean and scary isn't. I just have a soft spot for him. Yeah, he is the worst of the five smaller sets, but he's not terrible. But I understand if he's the last creature people reach into their wallets for. Still, this just makes me feel bad for the color brown and every character who wears it. It always seems to be the fate of stone-themed characters in general to turn out this way, to be lacking in some respect. I'm not gonna pretend he's my favorite, but he's okay. His awkwardness is precisely what I like about him. Tarek and Melum are an odd pair. One thing you need to keep in mind about Melum is that he isn't his own set. He comes packaged with Kopaka. So I won't be able to tell you whether I recommend him or not until I get to the other part of the set in the upcoming video that focuses on the Toa. I will say though that most of the things I like about Tarek, I also like about Melum, if not even a little more. Sometimes less. Tarek and Melum are more alike than any two of most of the other creatures. One is a mole or shrew, and the other is a yeti or polar bear-like creature, but to me, they both look like members of a single species that's sort of splitting into two breeds, each adapted for a different environment. Tarek being more heavily armored and equipped with more claws made for digging, while Melum looks like he's just trying to get by in his own little icy corner of the world. Tarek is even a little taller than Melum, giving Melum that more stout feel that I like to see in the line's ice-themed characters, similar to the Protector of Ice. Going back to the two creatures, even their color schemes are very similar. Interestingly though, they have very different functions. Melum swings his claws down in a digging motion that comes off as very aggressive. Unfortunately, his arms don't actually reach very far, but it's still a fun function. Melum's arms swing together, like he's trying to crush something or clap or hug. It's cute, and when I put him on Kopaka, I can't help that he looks like he's trying to get a piggyback ride. Melum is the most diminutive of the creatures, and I have a bit of a hard time justifying purchasing him by himself, or at least slightly harder than Tarak, but for now, I'll just say that I do like him. Whichever of the two you prefer will depend on whether you think Tarek is too over the top or which function you like better. Still, I'd say these two suffer the most when merged with their own respective Toa. Uxar and Nikir's wings still flap, Akita's guns still work, and Kitar's blades can still swing up and down. But these two... Well, tricky in practice, I can sort of buy Tarek's arms being used to dig in front of Anua, like they're swimming through the earth. But all Melum can do is... At the very least, he does look cool, but like I said, we'll get to that next time. 
By themselves, the creatures are okay at worst, and pretty great at best. They're a welcome change-up that provided a lot of fun new builds for me. From best to work, I'd say... Akita, Ikir, Uxar, Terak, and Kitar, though Kitar is still fine to me. Melum is sort of in his own category, but if you like Terak, you'll like Melum. Heck, in some ways, I actually find Melum a little more endearing. There's one more thing we gotta talk about, though, the Shadow Traps. Some people think these things are boring, but I think they're really cool. Let's look at them for what they are, though. They're bear traps. That walk. And have eyes. Say what you will about how easy you should be for the Toa to destroy things like this, but it can't be anything but crushingly painful. The fact that they have legs makes them very threatening, and I like that they're made for specific environments, like the vines on the jungle shadow trap being used as a sort of camouflage while it hides in the bushes. Think bear traps are scary? Just give them legs and an eye and imagine them following you around. These things are made to stalk the creatures, and then jump on them and bite them, probably even weakening them with some shadow power until Umarak can show up to claim them, and force them to merge with them in this weakened state. It's a pretty sound strategy, and they serve their purpose well. They also, oddly enough, have quite a bit of personality, depending on how you position them. Again, it's those legs. They're very expressive. One might look fast and sneaky, one might look angry like a robot pit bull. Or you can pose the legs to be all like, woogly woogly. What was that? You can even make them look like they're straight up about to pounce sideways onto one of the creatures. I think the different legs go a long way to making each one feel more unique and different than the skull spiders ever did. I still like the skull spiders, and they fill the role of evil mask thing that turns people bad better than most things, but this year, they've come up with something completely different and new. And that's scary. I get that. They could have tried to make something like a skull spider, only even worse. But they didn't, so I don't think it's right to say these things are so much less threatening or interesting than the skull spiders because they weren't made to one-up the skull spiders in their area of expertise. These guys do their own thing, and I think they fill their very different role as well as could be expected. Also, here's a nice skull spider. It's not in any of the sets, but I wanted to make it so here it is. One last thing I really like about them is the amount of detail. This is very G1, and like the creature's heads, there's a lot of connection points, so I can see this piece having a lot of mocking potential. If any of you guys don't like these, fine, just don't act surprised like it's weird that other people do, or like you can't see why. My favorite is the water shadow trap. I also think it looks good paired up with the other shadow traps, especially the jungle one. It has the longest legs, a repeller, and little grabby hands. I really wish they gave it a yellow eye though. I mean, they even did it in the show, and the piece does exist, so... here. Yeah, that's better. It was so easy, it kind of baffles me that LEGO didn't do this. In fact, here they all are with more appropriate eye colors. If there is one thing I will criticize about these, it is the lack of variety in eye colors, but whatever. Considering how big some of the creatures are, I'm glad including these didn't jack up the price. Another thing I like about the creatures is how nice they look next to last year's protectors. Most of them, anyway. Again, it's just another thing to make these sets more diverse and make Akoto feel more alive, while keeping these old sets pretty relevant. They feel just different enough in terms of colors not to feel like they're owned by the Akotans, but they're clearly a part of the Akotans' world. Or maybe it's the other way around. They also introduce a lot of cool new technic focused builds for people like me who enjoyed the Rahi back in the day, without going a little overboard like Lord of Skull Spiders did and letting the gimmick be the entire point of the toy. Maybe today's kids will have a little bit of trouble assembling these compared to last year's protectors, but if they already played with those sets a year before, consider these to be the next level. A new learning experience that introduces them to slightly more complex builds, the next stage of their development. It'll be good for them, and the final product is loads of fun. Overall, I'd say this little line is a success, in terms of whatever they were trying to do at least. Whether they sell well or not it is up to you. I recommend picking up at least a couple of these guys along with their respective Toa. Though I'd say all of them are worth picking up at some point just to try out the new experience each one offers. Next time we'll take a look at this year's Toa. Toodles!